What's up guys? Welcome to another episode of Sport Vitamins. Today I'm really honored to have uh, my mentor here with me, Francesco Cuzzolin. Welcome Francesco. Hi. Hi Roberto. Good morning. Good morning to all your listeners around the world. I'm honored to be part of your project. You know, I really appreciate what we have done in this, uh, in this period, you know, in this period of the, the year of our life and spending time in sharing knowledge and sharing experiences i think is one of the best way to to cover the time francesco is uh, uh by far one of the best strength coaches for basketball in europe he has worked with uh, many teams in uh, in italy and in europe and he also worked in the nba for the toronto raptors so without further ado francesco can we start giving me a little bit of a rundown on your background uh, my background is very, very simple. You know, like an athlete, I, I wasn't a basketball player. I come from uh, martial arts. I was a judo wrestler for many, many years. But uh, basketball has always been uh, one of my big, uh, big passion, you know. So I was playing basketball just uh, just for fun with friends and so on. When I was a, a student, a friend of mine was a former player. Uh, asked me to join him in a, in a, in a project uh, to start coaching and and uh, you know an unprofessional team you know a team in in, in the minor league in in Italy and uh, and I did decide to to accept the challenge so I did start uh, let's say coaching basketball when I was very very young I was just a twenty first and um, having a friend that was a coach so helped me to understand and at the same time was uh, trying to help him you know to understand what what does it mean uh, training uh, uh, with the process uh, with the, with the, with the logic with the sequence and, uh, and from there it did start my 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 professional experience after i finished my studies or bachelor in uh, sports science uh, and uh, you know i i tried to apply myself in many, many fields, rehabilitation, kinesiology, in many other sports. I was really angry of, uh, of uh, getting uh, um, knowledge from, from many, many fields. And probably my, let's say, contamination has been one of my secrets, let's say, you know, not, not being focused and, and, uh, and uh, concentrated always in, in some specific fields, but try to... Uh, understand and try to import anything that could be useful, you know, uh, for for my training method. Okay, so uh, now I'm also a PhD senior student. So now that it's, uh, I'm say another part of my professional experience, I try to to spend much more time in in science, in uh, in uh, researches, uh, in understanding. Let's say. Uh, I'm not coaching anymore basketball teams. I'm working like performance manager now uh, for a first division team here in Italy. So, and I'm working also in in uh, in uh, other projects in in many other sports. So I, I'm keeping to be contaminated, you know, from from other disciplines uh, and uh, and uh, working hard, like like uh, like it was uh, my my first day. Great. Can you tell us something about your background in basketball? Uh, well, what do you mean? Background in which kind of sense? Like your career. Oh, oh very, very simple background. You mean like a, like a professional coach? So, like I like I told you, um, I did start with the minors league, and um, but always trying to be professional. So one of the mistakes, in my opinion, that uh, young students are are doing uh, uh, now is they are not considering that. Uh, Anybody can judge what you are doing except yourself. So, also if I was working with a, with a unprofessional players, just practicing like two, three times a week, just for fun, you know, I kept my job seriously. So I was trying to prepare myself, to prepare my planning, to prepare my practices. Probably, I was trying to uh, to um, to coach myself in somehow, you know, in in, in getting better and better. So this is why uh, when I got the chance. To, to work seriously for a for a for a professional organization, and it happened in '95 with the Benetton Basketball. I can say I, I was ready. I mean, I was ready to accept the challenge. So I did start with Benetton, that at that time during the '90s, as being one of the best organization in Europe, you know, by far. 
And, uh, and there I got the chance of uh, sharing experiences with many top coaches, speaking like Mike D'Antoni, that now is coaching uh, in NBA. I did work with Mike for three seasons. Uh, I'm speaking about the coach Zelimir Obradovic, uh, Dead Blatt, Ettore Messina, and uh, Oktomai Muti. Uh, I mean, it was an international organization. So, uh, and from there, I was able, you know, to, to build up more knowledge, more information, and uh, having, you know, talented players that can uh, provide a lot of information about what is working, what is not working. So, Benetton has been my alma mater, let me say, you know, the place where uh, I was able to improve my, my approach and my way of, of training. I got the chance to work with um, Virtus Bologna in very successful uh, moment in 2001 and 2000 2001 so uh, with a uh, big star uh, players like uh, Manuel Ginobili like Antoine Rigado uh, like Marco Jaric uh, uh, Rashad Griffith and so on Matthias Modish so that team won the Euroleague in 2001 and, uh, and after I was able to come back in Benetton again, again with coach uh, D'Antoni. And uh, in 2006, I got the chance to, to coach the Russian national team with the coach David Blatt. And it was another amazing experience because of coaching a national team and uh, being not, uh, not Russian uh, has been a very challenging situation for me. And uh, also that time was very successful because uh, in 2007, we won the European Championship in Spain against uh, the Spanish national team in Madrid. And uh, that big result uh, brought us to play at the Olympic Games in Beijing 2008. And at the same time, I was also a consultant from, uh, for SESC and Moscow. So I was able to put together you know, my experience uh, with the Russian players and with the national team. But at the same time, with my assistant, uh, being able to, to follow plays during the season in Seska. And uh, Seska at that time, with coach Messina, was very successful, winning Euroleagues, uh, winning uh, Russian titles, and so on. So another you know, big experience of how I was I mean, able to follow other people working. So share information, uh, assessment, uh, uh, the way you can uh, plan the micro cycle depending from different moments of the season. So working at backstage, it's, it's another very important part of, uh, of uh, my professional uh, experience. After Russian, I did work with the Latvia National uh, Federation. Uh, and in 2009, I've been uh, in NBA with the Toronto Raptors. Unfortunately, my experience didn't last longer because in 2012, for the lockout situation and from some uh, familiar uh, issues, uh, I did decide to come back in Europe and uh, I wasn't able to, to wait for six months uh, without uh, knowing about a job, about personal situation, so on. So I signed for the, for the Italian Basketball Federation and I did work... Uh, for the uh, Italian Basketball Federation. Before, I was just working like uh, uh, following the, the national team. But from 2012, I was in charge of the four old federation. So all the, let's say, um, uh, every team for the male uh, uh, section. And uh, just at the end, I was following also the females, uh, female um, national team and following all the, uh, let's say, certification about coaches, about strength conditioning coaches, and so on. And I did decide to quit in uh, 2006, uh, 2016 uh, because uh, at the time uh, I was uh, jumping back on another EuroLeague situation, uh, another team, but at the end I got a big chance to sign like a director for research and innovation for one of the biggest companies in the world about uh, sport and fitness uh, equipment, uh, Technogym. And, uh, you know, in Technogym, uh, uh, I was in charge of the scientific department until October, uh, let's say September 2019. So now I'm still working uh, like a consultant for them. 
but uh, I did decide, uh, I mean, to change again my my professional experience, uh, um, working like perf- uh, performance manager, following uh, other athletes from other sports. So once again, I like to keep my mind spread and uh, I like to get new challenges. So I'm, I'm a soul that is never, I mean, uh, slowing down, you know. So when I got a new challenge, I, I put all my energy on it. And uh, this is what I'm still doing. Wow, what an amazing career it has been so far, Francesco. So let's go back to when you got your foot in the door of basketball with Benetton Treviso. How important it was for you to work uh, for such a, a high-level team? It was back in the days. It was a, definitely a powerhouse for European basketball, and uh, where you were able to establish like a, um, a philosophy, right? A strength conditioning philosophy over there. Uh, I, I won't say philosophy. I, 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 I can easily say a method. You know, this is what uh, one of my mentor, uh, Alvar Mail, during the nineties, you know, told me. You know, uh, you're at the beginning of your career. Don't waste time. Try to build a lo- build a logic sequence of training. You know, uh, trying to understand uh, which is your main assessment, uh, which is uh, your main goal. How you can uh, differentiate, you know, your your workouts depending from your athletes, but depending from uh, uh, the season, the amount of games, depending from uh, uh, coaching uh, way of uh, of uh, training and so on. So Benetton, you know, working in the same place for 13 years, like happened to me, it means that any single piece of the puzzle was, uh, I can say, clear. And uh, like a strength conditioning coach, uh, you're not working alone. You know, you got to work inside an organization where coaches uh, understand what you are doing, which, which is the, the help that you are bringing to the organization, to the team. And uh, therapists are working with you. Management is working with you. Uh, uh, you know, doctors are working with you. So there are many pieces they have to join together. You know, uh, so this is why uh, Benetton was very helpful. You know, and put me in a, in an extraordinary situation where when I was asking, you know, to get technology, to get uh, new information, or uh, or to invite uh, experts, you know, to join the organization. Uh, to understand and to realize w- what we can get for new expertise. You know, my general manager was 100% available in, in providing me any kind of effort I could, uh, I could ask. And uh, my GM, Maurizio Gerardini at the time, that now is, a, is a, the GM of uh, Fenerbahce, I think it was a, one of the best GM in Europe uh, and is still one of the best GM, not just in Europe, in my opinion, because he's a great manager. I mean, he put you in a situation where, first of all, he trusts you 100 percent. And uh, but trust doesn't mean uh, that he's not controlling what you're doing. I mean, trust means uh, putting you in a situation where you, you are always working 100 percent of your potential. So I, I did try to give my 100 percent for many years in an amazing situation, in an amazing, amazing organization. This is why, in my opinion, at that time, we were able to build something. Okay, interesting. So, as we said, you worked in EuroLeague, NBA, national teams. And uh, so let's have a bird's eye view on all the different approaches that you can have as a strength and conditioning coach at, at these different levels. Okay, first of all, we got to split in two parts, you know, uh, when we are speaking about season and when we speak about tournament. So usually national team are playing tournaments. So you play a high density uh, tournament, high density games tournament. So many games in a short amount of time. Uh, EuroLeague, you know, you have a 10 month season with a, a certain kind of games usually you play most of the time twice a week and uh, you're not uh, traveling comfortable so you're traveling uh, not always in a charter flight most of the time you could fly also commercial so i mean it's it's not an easy situation and you are practicing hard because games are without tomorrow you know every game it's it's a it's a you know a must have um 
NBA is different because the intensity of games is uh, is higher. You play 82 games in uh, in six months. Uh, organization are amazing, and most of the time, the main problem is lack of time to practice. So it's true that you gotta find a way of uh, differentiate your your uh, your workouts. You differentiate which is the training load, but many times. You can do just something, you know. You, you are not able to uh, to think about which is the optimal approach. So, in my experience, uh, the Euroleague is now, for a strength conditioning coach, professionally wise, probably the best challenge, because you can really coach. You cannot cheat. You don't cheat, uh, you know, in Euroleague. You, you gotta practice hard because uh, all the teams are really competitive. And uh, you got the best uh, players in Europe. You got the best coaches. So in Euroleague, you are seriously practicing. You, you, you cannot avoid to practice and, 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 and uh, thinking to be competitive. What does it mean? In, in, in NBA, you practice, but talent can make um, can makes the difference. You know, uh, talented players can win the game. Uh, System is never the main the main goal of their games. You know they got system for sure, but you don't work to build, you know, a system in any single situation. You know you, you cannot be so stressful with the players. You know you gotta let them play with their talent most of the time. You gotta give them some ideas because if you are, I mean, if you are coaching too much in NBA, you don't cover the system. So in NBA is a real marathon run, uh, you know. So you gotta keep a, a good pace, uh, not too slow, not too fast. Trying to cover the season. In Euroleague, every game from the first one to the last one is the main game, because every game is in and out. So this is why, in my opinion, you know, uh, Euroleague has been an amazing experience for for myself. Uh, I did try with Benetton, I did try with Virtus Bologna, and uh, like a consultant for uh, for Seska, for Fenerbahce. So I can say the amount of, uh, uh, let's say, training you got to organize uh, for a Euroleague team is very challenging for, uh, for a strength conditioning coach. And uh, approaching the season, of course, there is a big part of our season, which is the off-season. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. this is the part where uh, all the players can uh, develop their body. And uh, if they're smart enough, if they're willing to get better, that's the, that's the time of the year where they should put uh, the most of the work in. And uh, what are the main differences uh, in terms of approach between uh, EuroLeague and NBA players? Uh, theoretically, it's true what you say, but uh, practically it's not. Um, first of all, because... Uh, If you are a Euroleague team, you got a bunch of national team players. They have to cover some uh, some uh, duties for their federation. So there is not such a big amount of time that you can uh, spend and invest on your body or in trying to, um, let's say, regenerate your body in, in a better way after long season and so on. So once again... Um, Theoretically, I say yes. If you have, if you have like a two, three, month, couple of months, because let's say Euroleague and seasons are finishing in June more or less, and uh, second week, third week maximum of August, you are in a training camp. So let's say a couple of months. So in a couple of months, you can make something, but it's never the optimal because uh, in any case, you gotta take a part of regenerate yourself. We know that uh, the active regeneration, active recovery is always the, the best. And after you have a maximum four, five, six weeks where you can build up something, you know, and many players are trying to invest this time and try to develop something. Um, some of them are working on uh, specific strength programs, uh, working with uh, most of the time uh, um, high percentage of load, something that you cannot do during the season try to develop a kind of a submassima strength that could be transformed in power and, and, uh, and speed strength uh, during the season. 
and uh, or they are trying just to, I mean, to heal for an injury, to rehabilitate from an injury, having more time to do the right things in the right way. Because a, a rehabilitation during the season has a different logic that, that the rehabilitation period in off-season, where you can take care every single day about yourself, about recovery, and so on. In any case, during the season, the first goal is to come back as soon as possible to help the team. Okay, so it is a completely different approach. In NBA, it's different, yes, because if you're not playing uh, uh, playoffs, your season is finishing uh, late April, so you have a huge amount of time, May, June, July, August, part of September, let's say four months and a half, you know, to think about yourself. And in four months, you can do a lot of things. Uh, this is why... Uh, let's say any uh, NBA player usually join uh, uh, some uh, um, training period, you know, with other players also to play games, scrimmages, and so on. But m most of the time they are working with their personal trainer, they are working with their individual coach, trying to develop some skills. So you are always working on your uh, weak points, trying to. To be ready for the next season at the highest level. So four months, it's a huge amount of time, and this is why you know the the, the training camp, for example, the preseason period in NBA is very very short. Okay, so when the season starts, uh, in after a couple of weeks you start playing games. So in a couple of weeks, you cannot develop, let's say, a specific conditioning program for a team. So you got to be ready. I, I cannot say 100%, but you got to be ready 70%. And this is why usually most of the time when the ABA season starts, the team are never 100% ready. They develop conditioning playing. So it takes, let's say, a couple of months to see a decent conditioning, you know, on playing, uh, on on uh, on skills, on uh, lack of mistakes during the game. If you watch NBA games, this is why I've never watched NBA before February. <laughs> Makes sense. So uh, during the off season, uh, as you just said, if you have an NBA player, that's where uh, you can work uh, more uh, the most with him. And uh, especially if you have uh, one of these players want wanting to work with you. And uh, how important it is to have a good relationship with these players? Uh, I mean, it's always important to have a good relationship. That doesn't mean uh, having a friendship. Uh, doesn't mean uh, you know being a buddy. Uh, uh, usually, when I'm trying to build a, a, a working uh, relationship, it's question of uh, how much you recognize that I can help you. So it's, uh, you can see my knowledge, my experience that can really be useful for you. So this is why, this is the key where I did try to establish the relationship. It's never being a, a friend, let's say, you know, so being uh, for sure, you know, uh, uh, an open uh, guy, uh, ready to share ideas, feelings, feedbacks is important. But when I'm coaching, I'm seriously coaching, and uh, being a coach means uh, uh, say that something is not working in a proper way, or something has been done in a good way. So I'm usually, you know, uh, using the stick and the carrot, like you say, you know, uh, the broom and the carrot, uh, because this is the only way that you can coach a player. You know, try to establish some clear rules. Um, I've never worked with the uh, with the players or coaches. Also, for me, it's the same. Just because I was uh, their friend, friendship is something different. And uh, how do you cope with uh, being far, uh, far away from your players? Okay, when I was in in NBA, we were traveling a lot during the summer. We went visiting them, and we were trying to establish a relationship with their coaches. Uh, this is something that, uh, in my opinion, not any uh, NBA conditioning coach understands how important are relationships. Uh, also with uh, other colleagues, 
not to see a personal trainer for for a for a, an NBA player like a, an enemy, you know, like a, a, a competitor. I've never seen a competitor. If there is an open mind guy, you know, and and a, and a clear person, you know, so my doors were always open. I got a lot of friends in the states. I'm still in touch with them because we were respecting each other, respecting positions. So during summertime, I have no chances to work with uh, some of my NBA players, but their personal trainers uh, uh, know very well that during the season, the situation was completely opposite. They have no chance to travel, you know, and to stay close to their players during the NBA season. So the team put some rules that were very clear. This is the off season. Try to take care about yourself. And these are the goals that we are trying to uh, advise you. And but when the season starts, you are part of the team, and you gotta respect team rules. So in my in my uh, position, I was a kind of a connecting people guy, you know. So because any information that I could get from colleagues, you know, coming from all over the world, because I had at that time Spanish players, Slovenian players players from uh, California, from Dallas, from uh, Lithuania, and so on. It was impossible for me to be in so many places during the summer. But having the chance to pick up the phone and to share with a colleague information, feelings, how the things were going, the process, how the players were was uh, committed in respecting you know, a training um, a plan in off-season, for me, was very, very important. Yeah, and... Uh... Most of all, it's really important to have players that take ownership over over their development, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. They have to be responsible. They they have to st- they have to understand that they are a kind of company. You know, you, your body, your performance is your company. You gotta take care about your company, like uh, like uh, you are taking care about your family. They have to understand this part of the business. So let's move on and uh, let's talk about after. You signed with the Toronto Raptors in the NBA. What was your first move? Okay, uh, I mean the first European. You know, so being the first European NBA means uh, um, having some pressure on your shoulders. You know, so trying to understand what to do in the right way and, and, and try to avoid mistake. Um, so a step inside the organization, trying to understand how I could help the organization and making small changes. Just to be honest, my biggest satisfaction that my assistant that I hire at that time is still the strength conditioning coach of the Raptors. And we are still friends because when I decide you know, to leave the organization, my GM at that time asked me, is your assistant ready to take your uh, position? I say yes, because they were, I mean, they, they did understand what we were trying to build up. And building up was, uh, you know, like I say before, you know, being open, try to make small changes in, uh, in, uh, in players' habits. So understanding that uh, having a, a lifestyle that, uh, a res- that is respecting some rules can provide a great amount of energy can influence your performance. So you cannot just be focused on the training session, but you got to share a lot of education with players. So you are with the players like what? Three, four, five hours a day, if you're lucky. What's happening the other 19 hours? So once again, we were working together. Together means what can I help you? What can I do to help you? So it was very important for me trying to understand, are you doing breakfast this morning? I wasn't asking about breakfast because I was controlling, but because if you are practicing for two hours running up and down the court without breakfast could be a problem. Above all, if you're doing this on a daily basis, so in your habit, breakfast can easily jump because you want to sleep 30 minutes more in the morning. So, First of all, I was trying to understand my players, which were the main mistakes they were doing to be professional and which were the small changes 
that we could do inside the organization without creating uh, like a revolution. Revolution is a very dangerous situation. You know, when a change is accepted because it's bringing value, you cannot control it anymore. But if you're bringing new habits like revolution from today, this is the way we're supposed to do, you have to control the players every day. It takes a lot of energy and you cannot do it. It's not bringing any kind of results. So my opinion was moving slowly. And uh, I was very lucky because, uh, let's say, a big part of my team at that time was European. So they did know me very well. I got Manuel Calderon. I got Andrea Bargnani. Uh, I, I got the Russian Estervich, Ido Turkoglu. Uh, a lot of players, uh, Marco Bellinelli, a lot of players for Europe. So they didn't know me well. So they didn't know my experience, uh, what I could make for them, and so on. So they were my first, uh, let's say, promoters. And uh, But at the same time, I have a big part of the team that were, you know, doing different things. And, uh, you know, it, it took time, but uh, with, the, with, the, with the, the theory of small taps, you can make a lot of, 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 uh, of distance, you know. And so this is why, in my opinion, um, you got to understand which are the weak points where you can apply your knowledge and working on the on on uh, on on the main one, you gotta create a kind of priority of uh, of uh, changes, you know. So that was my my first uh, approach. Second, putting together all the different figures that were working around the team. So what the therapists were doing, what I was doing, what the coaches were doing, how we can understand which is the training load of the day, how we can save players, how we can share information. So. I'm a kind of uh, maniac about the numbers, but not because numbers uh, can decide for myself, but because numbers can clarify my choice. So this is why, you know, I was uh, collecting um, minutes of practicing, intensity of practicing, rate of perceived accession of practicing, uh, quality of uh, uh, sleeping. I was uh, collecting uh, muscle soreness, basic things, nothing... Uh, uh, technical, I mean, nothing uh, technological and nothing difficult to um, to, um, to share. And uh, probably, you know, numbers that could be also misunderstood. But what I was trying to do is uh, trying to reduce uh, the amount of mistake that could be done without having information. So the first step was collect information and share information with all the people that were working around players. So players got to feel that uh, all the coaching staff and all the uh, medical staff are working on the same page. So it wasn't easy at the time, you know, because uh, not any persons uh, got the same approach. But once again, with, a, with, a, with the idea of making small steps, small steps, we were going in that direction. And now... I'm very, I mean, uh, excited in, in seeing how many NBA organizations are speaking about performance department. They are building up uh, like, uh, uh, or they are hiring uh, uh, sports science and science people. They are hiring uh, um, data experts and so on. So they are running that kind of process. Okay, in 2009, it wasn't so, uh, so, uh, so common in NBA because we are speaking about many years ago. And uh, what kind of information do you share with the coaching staff, with the management, and also with the player? Okay, we had an agenda that I'm still using it uh, with the new versions, where we were collecting, for example, uh, the, the status of the day, how the players were presenting at practice. Uh, you can have players that are coming that are 100% available. Some players were coming with some small issues, or making some treatments to, I mean, to be available for practice or for, for, for the game. Some players were under medication, can happen, you know, for some uh, kind of issues. And uh, some players were injuries, some players were, I mean, the situation, the status of the team could be completely different. So for any single situation, I got a, a color, you know, that could be green with anything, when anything is going right, it could be red, you know, 
dark red when when uh, the player is not available for a long period. So the coaches could easily understand which was the status, not just of the day, but of the last week of the last month. And we were monitoring uh, minutes of practices and intensity of the practice. And about games, we were, we were monitoring, for example, how many minutes you were you was playing and which was your perceived accession from the game. Usually, when we are speaking about performance, performance is never just physical. Performance can be cognitive, physical, and emotional. And they are influencing each other 33% for each part. Because, for example, you can play just 15 minutes, but in very, let's say, rough situation, where coaches are, where when, uh, when uh, referees are calling you uh, bad fouls, and uh, you are getting nervous, and you are missing uh, some uh, easy shots, and so on. Physically, you just play like 15 minutes, but the amount of energy that you spent on that 15 minutes make you perceive the game, your performance, very, very hard. So without uh, you know going uh, deeply inside uh, this kind of uh, uh, different approaches of performance, we were just collecting a feeling, but collecting also which were the main, the main part that was influencing that kind of feeling. Was was a physical, was emotional, or was, was cognitive, for example. If the coach is coaching hard, a new play, a new system, and you don't feel com comfortable inside the system, and you got to understand what you do, and you feel yourself like uh, lost in the space, you know, it's not physical, it's not emotional. You just don't understand what's going on. You don't know how to play. You don't know what to do. Or you're always in the wrong place at the wrong moment. So we were sharing this information with the coaches. And coaches were helping me to get information. Because when I was uh, picking up players to make some individual workouts of the spare time, you know, it was important for me to understand how much I could push the player or how much I could help the player to recover. So it was a, you know, at that time, one of the coaches were helping me so much was PJ Carlesimo. PJ Carlesimo has been, a, you know, head coach for many years in NBA, very, very respectful coach, but he was really taking care about collecting information. His way of working was very close to mine. So we were building up this kind of relationship between uh, an, 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 an assistant coach and between myself in understanding how we we'll provide information to the head coach and from the other side to the medical and, and, uh, and trainer staff. So this was, uh, you know, the job that uh, we have done at that time. And, uh, and uh, I've still a lot of numbers, I've still a lot of uh, Excel sheet on my computer. And now, after many years, we are working, I'm still working uh, in the team in uh, Treviso Basket, where I'm working so, uh, so far. Uh, and we are developing new system in the same in the same process. New numbers, clear windows, but the approach is exactly the same. If you share information, you can reduce the amount of mistakes that you are doing working uh, alone. And especially if you are collecting a lot of data, you're having a, uh, like a you having a big uh, amount of numbers. And uh, if you're not assessing, you're guessing. So this exactly, is if you're not approach. assessing, you're guessing first. But believe me, not big numbers, but the right numbers. You know, big numbers, you need technology that can help you to manage big numbers, you know, because it takes a lot of time, you know, to have this approach, to collect numbers, to share numbers. What I'm doing now is just trying to simplify the procedures and try to get the right number that will be shared. So usually to fill up, you know, the agenda with the numbers, got to take at least for any single figure that is working on the agenda, no more than five, 10 minutes a day. You know, so you can spend five, 10 minutes a day understanding which are all the advantages you can bring at home. So no more than five, 10 minutes a day, because if I gotta stay one hour a day just to fill up, uh, you know, an Excel file with numbers of, uh, you know, picking up the phone and sharing with all the other people, you know, what has been done uh, today, trying to plan uh, practice of tomorrow, you, you can do it in a, in a training camp. But when the season starts, there are other priorities. You, you cannot keep the consistency.
on doing uh, things in, in this way. So the consistency of tracking numbers is the main goal. So don't collect a huge amount of numbers that you cannot collect with consistency. You try to reduce the amount of numbers, getting like five, six, seven, ten pillars, and keep working on it. Interesting. And uh, okay, let's move on, Francesco, and uh, let's talk about uh, your philosophy in the weight room. Wow. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, my philosophy in the weight room. Okay. Wow, my philosophy in the weight room. I have no philosophy. What does it mean? Having a philosophy means uh, thinking about something that could be useful in that specific situation. My philosophy that doesn't exist, but it's my approach, is trying to understand what can I do to help players. I did make this mistake for many, many years, Try to, I mean, present myself to players with an idea of uh, workout, an idea of practice. Now, having experience of many, many years, uh, I'm acting uh, differently. I try to understand which are the weak points of my players when they are playing basketball and how I can help them in a weight room. What does it mean? There are moments of the season where exercises, instruments, um, training load can completely differently manage. Variables in the weight room are not one are not two, but many. Many coaches are really uh, really focused on how to increase the, the, the weights, for example. Uh, some of them are really focused on uh, how to increase the weights and uh, speed. So really focus on power exercises. In my opinion, I need something more. I need uh, weight, so load. I need speed. But I need stability. I need coordination. I need a locomotion. So I got a different uh, range of variables that I can manage for any single exercise. And the way that I can use these variables create my way of working, depending from what the players need when he's playing basketball. So for me, the weight room is not a separate workout from the floor, but it's a workout that has to be done to complete your training process. The approach looks the same. It's completely different. So players usually in the past, they were going to the weight room to do something different. Coaches were sending players in the weight room because they don't want to see them run up and down the floor. Weight room was a, okay, let's keep a little bit of strength because strength is connecting with power. It can help to be powerful, powerful for 10 months. I'm not working that way. I try to understand how do you move, which are your angles, which is your coordination, which is your stability, how you control your body, which are the main movements of your position on the floor. And from there, I, I'm doing like a reverse engineering and trying to understand which is the uh, kind of exercises mixing the, those variables that I was mentioning before and try to provide it, providing you the best workout. This is why I'm working individually. Now I'm speaking about, I mean, top teams. So for me, every, any player got a different uh, training sheet, a, a different uh, uh, goal to... Uh, to get in the weight room, you know. So when the players understand that, that this uh, program has been uh, tailor-made and any single exercise is connecting with his way of being a basketball player, they fall in love. They clearly understand what they are doing. It takes time. It takes energy. Uh, usually I'm working with uh, not many players, with an assistant. So you can have this approach, for example, when I was working with the national team, five, six players uh, 
at the most uh, with an assistant. So one coach, three players. And uh, we are not working for long sessions, 45 minutes the most, but very intense way of working. So the workout was very, very specific to play basketball. Speaking in season, enough season could be completely different, but the approach is exactly the same. So I, I cannot speak about philosophy. Are you functional? Are you traditional? Are you taking care about uh, uh, power lifting? You, you like it or you're, lo you're liking more uh, uh, suspension training? You're liking more kettlebells? They are just instruments, are not goals, you know. I try to use all of them. If you are able to manage, to understand which, uh, uh, what is bringing to you from different uh, tools, from different equipments, from different uh, uh, training load, you can build up a big purpose. You know, on, inside the big purpose, I'm going to decide which is helpful for you or not. So the approach is completely different, but it's not a philosophy. It's not, okay, the philosophy is this is the theory I'm trying to apply the theory here. No, 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 no. I just turn my back. I'm trying to watch you playing basketball. I try to get as many information possible. I got my assessment on your uh, uh, functional movement. Uh, uh, I'm trying to understand how your joints is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is uh, reacting to some exercises. Uh, if you got some former injuries, I'm sharing information with, uh, with a therapist. I try to collect as many information as possible. And after that, I try to create the receipt. And, and the receipt is to help you to play basketball. Great. So with this approach, you must have a strong connection with the coaching staff, of course, in order to be able to hammer away at the right weakness, right? Uh, absolutely. This is why I was asking, for example, many times to the video video guys, you know, to provide me some clips about some uh, mistakes, about some uh, issues, uh, because on that, I, I can easily understand how I can help the player. Not just in the weight room, because like I told you, weight room is just a part. But like strength conditioning coach, I'm working on the floor. You know, I can teach you position, hands, uh, how to use your body, how you can uh, uh, set your body in a proper position to react in a proper way. You cannot imagine how many things that can be done also with the professional players. So they are playing at the top level. They have talent. But they are still doing, in some details, you know, some mistakes that can help you to understand how you can add that. Okay. And uh, you have worked with uh, so many great coaches, like uh, Messina, Obradovic, uh, Blatt, uh, just to name a few. And uh, which was the most common request from the head coach? Okay, all the coaches are different. And... Uh, and all of them got completely different uh, working philosophy. Uh, working philosophy, wor uh, I mean, uh, uh, different uh, way to manage people around them, uh, different way to involve people around them, and so, and so on. So, generally speaking, um, I'm, we are part of the staff. So, my approach has always been how I can help my head coach. So you got to feel yourself part of a project, you know. So for sure, uh, in the past, uh, working with the coach D'Antoni, Messina, Bradovic, Blatt, and so on, they're completely different person and coaches. Their way to approach to basketball is completely different. Their culture is completely different. So my main goal has always been, how can I have my head go? And all of them were pushing me to provide a different kind of helps. Example, some of them were practicing a lot on the, on the, on the floor. Some of them were just taking care about the, the tactical part, you know. So you got to um, help players with some uh, kind of a different uh, way of uh, conditioning programs because then... Uh, above all players that were not playing, you know, 
they found that they couldn't keep the shape for the for for a for the long season. So they were, you know, uh, thinking uh, if the coach is calling me to make a, a higher effort, I'm not ready because I'm not practicing so much. Or the opposite, you know, there were some coaches who were practicing so hard that sometimes you got to go to the coach and explain to him that the situation is not clear. And if you are keeping that kind of a request could be dangerous in one week, two weeks. So their way of supporting formation and, uh, and helping players, you know, to work in a way, in a system or in another system is what a coach, a strength condi- condi- the conditioning coach, uh, can do easily. Because we know training, you know, we are uh, in touch with players in the locker room, on the floor, on the bus, you know. We got some information and feeling from players that not all these coaches uh, can easily get. So it doesn't mean that you are a kind of snitcher, you know, <laughs> that you are going to, to, to spy what, the, what the, the players are telling. But just, uh, you know, if, the, if it's in your mind is clear that the main goal is team result, okay, you got to understand which is your position inside the organization. So I did change many times my jersey. I mean, uh, with, the, with the Messina, uh, he was asking me some, uh, uh, some uh, clear things uh, and, uh, and uh, Velimir other things, uh, Mike other things, David other things, and all of them were teaching me something because uh, they are, I mean, great coaches, uh, great person with great personality. And so you, you, you can really learn a lot from uh, uh, work with them, not working for them. This is a completely different approach. I feel myself that I'm working with them. So when they establish with me a relationship, they were working together and they trust you and they trust your knowledge and they know what you can bring, it's very, very simple to change the jersey. And sometimes you are doing things that are necessary, not that you don't, that, that you like it, you know? If you think that you got to practice always in the way you like it, you cannot be professional. Sometimes you got to practice in the way is necessary for the team to perform at the highest level, not the way that you are thinking is the best. And this is what, you know, I was trying to do, uh, sharing my experience with these uh, top level coaches, working with them. Great. That's really important. And uh, okay, Francesco, what's one piece of advice that you would like to give to our listeners? You know what? Be yourself. It looks like a, I mean, a, a very simple and, and and basic quote, but I really trust that we cannot we cannot cheat. You know, when we are on the floor with our players, you gotta be yourself. You gotta create your own expectation. If you're asking to your players to perform. You are asked to yourself to perform. So many coaches are not thinking about their own performance. That means uh, being precise. That means uh, trying to, you know, prepare the best training programs possible. Trying to re- uh, to help a player to recover from an injury in a shortest amount of time in the better way. Uh, you know. Performing like a strength con- conditioning coach uh, is, is important. So, knowledge, communication, execution, because, uh, you know, in our position, we got to be able to show to our players has to be done in a, in, a, in a proper way. They are asking us, show me. You know, you are telling me how to do it, but can you show me? So, we got to work on ourselves in different fields. So this is our performance. So knowledge, communication, because we are working in a, in a team, in an organization. So you got to be able, I mean, to speak with the players, to speak with the coaches, to speak with the management, you know, bringing ideas and being proactive, not just bringing problems. You know, it's so easy to bring problems. You know, there are millions of people can easily come to bring problems, but just few of them can bring solutions. So in your specific field, can bring some solutions, 
okay, and share solutions with the people that are working with you, it means that you are trying to push yourself at the highest level of your personal performance. So trust in yourself, be yourself, and be committed. You are doing the best job in the world. Okay, thank you. So a lot of very insightful information, Francesco. Usually we will finish off the episode with the uh, three rapid fire questions, okay? Wow. Ready? Okay, yeah. the, the first one. I know you said you don't have a philosophy, your, yours is an approach, but uh, if you have to pick one exercise in the weight room, which one is it? Just one. <laughs> Just one, your favorite exercise. My favorite exercise. Um, I call it jumping press. It's a, a, it's a, it's a way of a simulate a, a layout situation. You are uh, making a light jump in a, in a staggered position, and you are finishing with a dumbbell overhead. So I call it jumping press, but it's a, a kind of a layup press. So very uh, interesting, you know, because the players are feeling that they are doing, they are finishing with power. So they love it. Okay. Second one. Uh, best, strength, best strength and conditioning book. Wow. Book. Mm. I, got, <laughs> I got all the books in the world. Uh, hasn't been written yet. Great answer. The best hasn't been written yet. Uh, if you have to choose... NBA or Euroleague? Euroleague, no question about it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Francesco. If, uh, Thank you. If some of our listeners would like to reach out to you, where can they find you? They can find you on the social. You got to be patient because uh, I'm not, uh, you know, always 24-7 uh, uh, available. Sometimes they put me messages and they are expecting a quick answer. I'm not at the phone so many hours a day. I'm really busy, man. But I try to answer at all the smart questions. You know, when the questions are just asking about uh, nothing, or uh, I'm not answering. So when they are, you know, polite in waiting, and uh, their question has, uh, has to be taken under consideration, I love it. Because uh, we grow up sharing ideas with others, so don't don't uh, don't forget it, you know. So I've always, you know, been one guy in the middle of the road, you know. Because uh, if you are making a question to me, and the question is putting some uh, doubts in my mind, you're helping me. So if your listeners have got questions and time to wait a little bit, you know, being patient, I will be 100% available to, to give my best to them. Thank you, Francesco. It's been a great episode. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for hanging out with us today. Thanks, Roberto. Hope to see you soon. And having the chance, you know, to hug you without a mask. Bye, Francesco. All the best.